The shadow brokers are back with more NSA data, the FCC passes some new privacy laws, and should hacking back or counterattacking be legal? All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I'm Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for Tuesday, November 1st, 2016. Your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. And yes, I am in my Star Trek uniform. I am recording this on Halloween. First off, I wanted to give a big thanks to all of our patrons over at patreon.com slash threatwire. You fund the making of this show, so thank you for letting us bring you security news every single week. This week, I would like to focus on the first story. The group who had previously released documented NSA hacking tools out into the wild is back on Halloween day, releasing more data for the masses. <laughs> Trick or treat. On October 31st, Shadow Brokers updated their Medium account to say that they were dumping data online that showed IP addresses of servers used by the Equation Group. Now, the Equation Group, you may remember, has been linked as an internal NSA hacking group many times in the past. So according to security researcher Mustafa al-Bassam, the new data contains a quote, list of servers compromised by the NSA to use as exploit staging servers. This list contains over 300 domains and IP addresses related to 49 different countries, but it doesn't prove that these servers were hacked by the NSA. Now, while the shadow brokers first claimed that they'd only release more docs whenever they got a winner of their original auction, they ceased said auction and chose to release the data publicly anyways, even though they didn't necessarily get paid. This also comes as another NSA contractor is awaiting a hearing on his own stolen NSA documents. We will keep an eye on this story as it unfolds. That super big DDoS that hit DynDNS a little bit over a week ago should have been a pretty big wake-up call to many about the ongoing issues issues with IoT or Internet of Things. It definitely was for Virginia Democratic Senator Mark Warner, who wrote letters to the FCC, FTC, and the DHS, explaining the threat that we face from insecure Internet of Things devices. Warner asks if ISP should deny connections to devices that are delegated as insecure, and if there was something that the government could do to vet IoT devices in the first place. And not only that, but more legal issues arose this past week as researchers at Invincia found three different vulnerabilities in the Mirai source code that would enable a user to crash a sequence of attacks, but leave the bot running. An attacker could just restart the attacks though, so this doesn't necessarily remove the botnet, it just kind of crashes part of it. The problem is whether it would be legal or not for a DDoS protection firm to do this. Ed McAndrew, an attorney in Washington, D.C., says, quote, as a general matter, you cannot send code to another computer that is unauthorized in nature. If you think about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or CFAA for short, you are really talking about unauthorized access to a protected computer. The question is, if the code is on the bot, you are modifying code that resides on these devices. I think it constitutes access, and you would have a potential problem with the CFAA. Counterattacks impose a sort of gray area for white hat hackers. When you are protecting yourself and killing the botnet process on the infected IoT device, but not removing the malware, would it be considered slightly helping or not? The Federal Communications Commission passed new rules on October 27th requiring ISPs to protect consumer privacy by requiring consent from a customer before sharing their personal information with a third party. ISPs will have three categories that they will have to abide by depending on the type of data that they want to share. Opt-in confirmation from a customer includes data about their location, their financials, their health, their social security numbers, their children's info, which I find incredibly weird, uh, web browser Housing history, app usage, and communication content. Opt-out data includes service tier and email addresses, for example, and would require an obvious opt-out format. And lastly are exclusions, like information for billing and collections, uh, which would not require consent from the consumer. These new rules offer customers more transparency about their ISPs, and they include the rule that the ISPs must now notify customers in the event of some kind of data breach, which is Pretty cool. Now, who is against the new rulings? Of course, it's the Association of the National Advertisers. ISPs have a full year to comply with the FCC's ruling, though. I want to send a big heartfelt thank you again for being a patron of ThreatWire. You can contribute over at patreon.com slash threatwire to get your name on threatwire.net as well as your own fur baby in the show. 
because the fur babies are my favorite part. If everyone that watches the show donates a dollar per month, we would successfully cover all of our fees like rent, like electricity, plus we would be able to do a lot more with the show, like uh, upgrade the cameras and bring you a lot more content. Of course, if you cannot contribute, you can always give the show a thumbs up. You can subscribe on youtube.com slash hack5. Last week, we got it up to about 1,800 likes last time I checked. I wanna see if we can get this episode up to 2,000 likes. That stuff actually really does help with our analytics. It gets our shows in front of more eyeballs, so it definitely helps. And I really want to thank everybody who, you know, gets out there and actually contributes. Love it when you guys do that. It's really fun to read your comments, too. And last but not least, you can find all of our episodes, links to our social networks, and other ways to contribute over at threatwire.net. And with that, I am Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet. Live long and prosper. Thank <laughs> you.